So welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you with us today. Um, we're thrilled to have these two amazing women, Patricia Mukin and Marta Benavides. Welcome to our 14th Salon of the Maternal Gift Economy Breaking Through series hosted by Genevieve Vaughn, who's with us, and the International Feminist for the Gift Economy. I'm Leticia Layson, your moderator. Our first speaker is Patricia Mukin. She is an Indian social activist, writer, journalist, and editor of the Shillong Times. She's known for her social activism. The Shillong Times is an English language daily from the Indian state of Meghalaya in the remote northeastern region of India. She served as a member of the National Security Advisory Board and has contributed her learnings to all the agency that looks at military security while often forgetting human security, food and water security. She also brought in gender perspectives to the board. Patricia has been a gender activist and also helped the world to understand the matrilineal society she comes from in her book, Waiting for an Equal World. Welcome, Patricia. Uh, thank you so much, Leticia and Jen for hosting me here. I think it's a great opportunity to share a story from this remote part of the big country called India. I am a tribal uh, in a country which is dominated by non-tribes. <laughs> so it, it's a very pe peculiar situation. We signed the instrument of accession to India only in 1948. So we are very new in the nation building process, very much like uh, the Native Americans. Um, I have been a teacher for close to 25 years and then uh, moved on to journalism. But even as a teacher, I wrote uh, articles and uh, those articles were largely dealing with uh, governance, with corruption in governance, because that is a very, very critical issue in, in India and in my state of Meghalaya. So from 1987, I have been writing articles and uh, for some reason, I haven't known how to dilute what I have to say. Many people tell me, you know, you could say things differently. Why do you have to say them so directly? And that's when I went, I began to question myself and ask myself, uh, what is it, why should I not be saying what I have to say in the way that it has to be said so that everybody understands it? Why does it have to be obfuscated? So some people tell me, no, you can't be too direct. Then uh, you'll be stamping on e everyone's toes. But I said, uh, if I have to write articles and they do not result in any action, then what's the point? And uh, in recent years, there have been government officials who have retired, and only after retirement, they wrote back to me saying, do you know that uh, whatever you write, we read with great respect, and uh, we also, uh, maybe you, you're not aware of it, but we also try and implement some of those things that you say. So it came very late in my years, to hear all these things, you know, I, I would have felt much better if I had heard all these earlier on. Maybe I could have attuned myself better. But anyway, so my journey in journalism started in 1987 uh, as a column writer. Uh, I wrote on a range of issues, but basically social issues. And as I said earlier, I'm a tribal. But in my state of Meghalaya, we have a lot of non-tribals and they, uh, you know, they, they are not allowed to live peacefully. They are, in 1979, there was a huge communal conflict and these non-tribals, some of them were killed, some of them were lynched, some of them, uh, some of their shops were burned and some had to leave the state. 
under duress, you know, because the tribes felt that the non-tribals were taking over everything. So at, at that time, I was quite young and I said to myself, how can we, we are all humans, how can we, uh, you know, go against a whole group of people in, in a sort of a communal outrage? And I have been asking that question again and again and again. And naturally, the people from my tribe are not happy about that because they think that I should be with the tribe. I should never go and help the non-tribes. The non-tribes are anyway much more progressive, much more intelligent, much more economically endowed. So why should you be siding with the non-tribes? But for me, I've, I've just felt always from the time I was young, I felt that I'm a human first and then my tribe later. And that's how I've lived the large part of my life as a human, uh, as a woman. So, uh, you know, when you are in this profession of writing, then you, you come into the public eye willy-nilly. You don't want to be there. You didn't write because you want to be, you know, in the limelight, but you just, you just come into the limelight and then you have to face a whole lot of defamation cases as well. When you attack a, you know, an individual or the government, then you're pulled up. Even though you, you have all the papers, you have the documents and you're writing based on those documents, you're writing the truth but you still have to pay the price. And I have been paying this price right from 1987 and so on and so forth till, till now. So it's a very, very difficult journey to, to be speaking the truth. Uh, it's easy to say, but it, you have to really pay a price. And sometimes the price can be very exacting because you, know, you, you have a family, I'm a, I'm a single mother. I brought up four children on my own. And sometimes uh, there, are, there are times when they, they are very afraid that uh, I will be attacked. And if I, if I die, who will look after them? I had my, my mother and my grandmother, of course, at that time, but they were still very frightened for me. Uh, also because I was um, opposing the growing militancy in my state. I, I, I opposed that and we formed a group called Shillong We Care. We formed this group essentially to tell these young gun-toting youth that the gun is not going to solve anything. If you need something, if you want something, if you have an issue, then dialogue is the way forward. And we are a democracy. In a democracy, you don't pick up guns. Uh, so these young people again became very offended by, you know, my participation in in Shillong We Care. They said, "Why do you want to, why do you want to stop us from what we want to do? There's so much corruption. This corruption will not be addressed unless we take up guns." But then we continued, we continued to oppose violence, and in 2001 these groups uh, signed some kind of agreement with the government and they came over ground. Some of them are still there, but they are a very minuscule number. So as far as violence is concerned, that militancy part of it is, is now over, but we have a different kind of very subversive violence. It continues. And last year in the month of July, uh, some of these non-tribal boys went to play basketball in a predominantly tribal area and they were very badly beaten up. They had head injuries and all that. So because I'm in the newspaper business, I get to know all these things very quickly. And I immediately put up on my Facebook uh, post saying, why is this happening repeatedly? Why is this happening repeatedly? Why are these non-tribals attacked again and again? on very flimsy grounds. And why is it that the attackers, the assaulters are never arrested? I asked these questions on my Facebook page and I, I even addressed the chief minister saying, will, will we ever see justice? Because 
many people have been killed from 1979, but no one has ever been arrested. No, especially not convicted. So you can imagine what sort of rule of law we have. There isn't any rule of law. Then I also come from the state where there is so much of natural resources. We have coal, we have limestone. In 2014, there was this National Green Tribunal which banned coal mining. But uh, they banned coal mining essentially because there were too many mining accidents. People would be trapped in these holes. You know, they are called rat holes. The whole process is called rat hole mining. And people, very poor people, would go down inside these mines. They would first go down straight, and then they would go horizontally and dig out the coal, bring the coal up to the surface. But sometimes what happens is these mines are suddenly flooded, and then these people get trapped inside. And they, by the time they are brought out, they're, they're already dead, and they're all bones. So this, these accidents have been happening again and again, and they happened also on the 30th of May this year, just a few days ago. And the bodies are still lying inside. The government and the, the agencies are still trying to retrieve those bodies. So for me, this is a very painful aspect of our governance because it shows that despite the ban on coal mining, it is carrying on illegally. And when I travel to these coal mining areas, those who travel with me are very afraid because you can easily get killed. Two activists uh, in 2018, they were women activists. They went to document this illegal mining and they were beaten up so brutally they were left for dead. Fortunately, they didn't die and they lived to tell the story. But even then, the person who who, who committed the crime, who beat them up, who assaulted them, he was arrested, but now he is out on bail. So it's a very painful journey for those of us who are in activism and media, which are both very exacting kind of activities. So um, the way I see it is speaking the truth has a huge cost. Sometimes it costs me my sleep. Sometimes it, it costs uh, your, you know, you, you can be depressed because you don't know what to do. You don't know who to go to. And uh, as I, I was telling the story of, uh, of uh, putting up on Facebook page, this whole assault on those nine boys who are playing basketball. And I was calling on the chief minister to invoke the rule of law because I'm, I was telling him that if we have law enforcers, or a law enforcement agency, why is it that people are getting away with all these criminal activities? Then the next day, uh, a police report was filed against me by the traditional institution of that locality where the boys were beaten up. They're saying that I have defamed them, that uh, these boys should not have been playing basketball because we are under lockdown because of the pandemic. So I said to them, if you don't want people to play basketball, you should lock up the basketball court. And even if people come to play there, you can address them and tell them, go away, don't play now. You can't play contact sports now. But anyway, uh, the police registered that uh, first information uh, report, and then they started their investigation against me. They started coming to my house. They started telling me that you're trying to create a communal conflict. I said, no, I was just asking for justice. Then uh, I approached the high court of my state and told them to quash this police report because it has no merit. But the high court also refused to do that. So we had to go to the Supreme Court. You know how expensive it is to go to the Supreme Court because it is far away in Delhi. And I live uh, about 2000 kilometers away from Delhi. But fortunately, I have a very good human rights lawyer friend who took this matter up and who took it pro bono. She didn't ask me to pay a penny because she said, you're fighting for the truth and I must support you. So this case was fought in the Supreme Court 
And on the 25th of March, we had a very, very, very enlightened judgment saying that uh, the police, you know, the police report is wrong. You cannot file these sort of cases against people who are speaking up because the constitution says, guarantees you the right to freedom of speech and expression. And this lady was only expressing her anguish. So why is she being punished? So that, uh, that uh, uh, Supreme Court judgment was really, really very helpful. And uh, it, in fact, it has been quoted uh, even by Columbia University and uh, many other universities. And recently another case of a similar manner was cited by the Supreme Court again. So I think this is a landmark case. And, and again, I feel that when you stand up for the truth, you may not win immediately, but in the long run, you will win. And it's not you who wins, it's the truth that wins. It's the, you know, it's, it's people who win. It's people who you fight for who win. So uh, this is what I, I want to say for now. Uh, I don't know what else I want to say. Oh, I, I just want to say one thing. Because I keep writing on these um, this illegal mining, so in April 2018, my house was attacked. You know, um, what you call a petrol bomb, it's a Molotov cocktail, it was hurled at my house and it landed just short of my bedroom window. If that Molotov cocktail had, had penetrated the window, the glass, the window pane, it would have landed on my bed. And because that room, my room is, uh, is all wooden, I have wooden floors and some wooden cupboards, it would have all gone up in flames. But I just saw the fire, the whole, a whole line of fire on my wall. And then I thought that maybe there was a short circuit of electricity. Then I looked out and I saw this open fire and there was just me and my helper in the house. So we, we got out to see what was happening. We saw this fire and in the meanwhile, the neighbors have all come in and they, they tried to put down, put off the fire. And one of the neighbors then saw that bottle with the petrol there and with all the implements. Then she said, oh, this is a petrol bomb. In the meanwhile, somebody had phoned up the police. The police came, they looked around, they, they did everything that they had to do, but those culprits uh, have never ever been found. And this is our story that you can commit any crime, don't have to pay for it. You know, that is the kind of signal that is sent by the law enforcers because they are never able to nab any evildoer. So I, I'll stop here for now. Maybe I will answer questions. Wonderful, thank you, Patricia. Um, we're really happy to have you. This amazing landmark case, speaking truth to power. I mean, really taking that up. Um, before I introduce Marta, I, I, a question came up in my mind. Um, you talked about being tribal and in your tribe is, if I remember correctly, you have a, a matriarchal, a matrilineal yes. line, right? Yeah. Matrilineal. Could you speak mm -hmm. a little bit, just a tiny bit oh, about yes. that? Because I think it's important. I'm wondering if that is what has given you the courage and also the, the passion to be able to speak from that because the women, the mothers are responsible to care for all of the community. Could you say a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, I, I am from the Kasi tribe and uh, we follow, we are the only ones, the only tribes that follow the matrilineal system in this whole country. So in the matrilineal system, lineage is from the mother's side. So if I am Mukim, the children also are Mukim. And uh, especially the youngest daughter has a very special place in the family scheme of things because she inherits uh, the family property from her parents, the ancestral property. Uh, if the parents have, say, 
have enough property, then they do give their other, their other daughters as well. But now increasingly, they're giving the sons also a share of whatever. But most families don't have uh, multiple properties. So they, they, they educate their children equally, both boys and girls. Uh, in this society, of course, it's true that um, women are uh, socially very mobile, economically mobile. We move out. We are very different from the Indian patriarchal society, which is so domineering, which has, uh, you know, the toxic kind of patriarchy, the toxic kind of masculinity. Uh, in this society, we find that uh, women are generally allowed to have their own spaces. They're allowed to move around. They're allowed to take up any profession they want. The only thing that they are debarred from doing is to take part in the local governance. We have these traditional institutions that we call the darbars. Women are not allowed to hold office in these darbars. So we've been trying to, uh, you know, to say that that we need in this 21st century, you need to have gender equality, gender equity, and maybe women's issues may will will you know will be looked after much better if we have women also in the councils, in the traditional councils, because. Uh, it's, a, it's an irony that we are a, a matrilineal society, but we have so many, many rape cases. I'm not sure how to connect these two. Recently, there was a, an, a, a judgment against a man who raped his own mother. He did that in 2019. And uh, the judgment, he was convicted only this time. So... Uh, and we are, we are hearing more and more of little children being raped. So I'm not sure whether this is um, a rebellion against matrilineal because men here have been, have, have started a movement, you know, to change over to patrilineal. They've been saying that matrilineal actually uh, does not empower men and, uh, because men are not empowered, we are not economically strong as a tribe, and therefore we should change. But uh, all of us, of course, have rejected that idea. And we are saying that, okay, if you have a problem with matrilineal, if you think, if you men think that you have not been treated, given your due privilege in society, let's talk about mm -hmm. it. But you can't change over uh, a custom, a tradition that is uh, ages old, because also there's a lot of confusion. You know, we do not marry into the same clan. If I'm a Mukim, I can never marry another Mukim. Then it becomes, um, what do you call that, incest. So if we have to change over to patrilineal, there'll be so much of this bloodline confusion. That's one. And besides, uh, What's wrong with matrilineal? What's wrong with women taking responsibilities or sharing responsibilities? This is what we, we keep engaging the men with. Uh, but we find that uh, it's, it's a difficult proposition. And there are very few women in politics. There are a lot of women in, uh, in, in, uh, in small businesses, and the irony of matrilineal again in our society is that there are very many single women headed households because women are easily abandoned. Once they're abandoned, they're not given any maintenance. They, you know, the tradition never spoke about maintenance. Tradition says that if a man uh, doesn't want a woman anymore, he can just leave. And that woman has to rely on her, her, her own clan, her own family. And because we are a matrilineal, the women have to carry the burden of looking after the children. 
the man doesn't doesn't look after the children the children don't live with the with the father they always live with the mother so this is one big challenge we are facing today and there's a lot of poverty there's a lot of poverty and you will if you come to my place to my state you will find a lot of women vendors by the roadside and if you ask any of them they say i'm a single parent so this is the bane of our matrilineal society we continue to fight and bring justice social justice but i think it's it's a very long journey thank you patricia i think um many of us ha don't have the experience of uh meeting people who are from a matrilineal, a matriarchy that's present day. And I would imagine that there are many, many challenges with capitalist patriarchy imposing yes. um, and colonialism and imperialism. So. Um, yes, and also, you know, there is an influence of, because we are surrounded by patriarchal societies, so the men seem to think that patriarchal societies do better than us and therefore this constant demand for change. Yes, yes. Well, we're very happy to have you with us and we support your fight. So thank you very much. I'm sure there are gonna be many questions about things that you have shared with us. So um, thank you. For now, I would like to um, introduce Marta Benavides, another, you know, I think in our presence today, we have these elders who have a very long history of social activism at both local and global levels to um, bring forward the issues, not only of women, but of peace, for all. And by the definition of uh, Heidi Gutner Abendroth, a matriarchy is this egalitarian place and they are peaceful societies. So we're just very fortunate to have you both. So let me just tell you a little bit about Marta. Well, first of all, I met Marta on this very big adventure in Porto Alegre, Brazil with Genevieve Vaughn. <laughs> and that was a wonderful experience. She turned 78 in November. Um, she's a feminist religious leader in El Salvador. As a philologian ordained as an American Baptist minister, a permaculturist, an educator, and an artist. Marta began working for human rights and peace in the 1970s after the military coup in El Salvador in 1979 in the outbreak of the Salvadorian Civil War. She became the leader of the Ecumenical Commun Committee for Humanitarian Aid, a group sponsored by Archbishop Oscar Romero. He was assassinated in 1980 and in 1982, Marta went into exile in Mexico and the United States and continued her efforts from there. In 1992, following the peace accords, Marta returned to El Salvador and founded the organization Siglo, is it 2023? 20, yes. yes. Known as an International Institute for Cooperation Amongst People, which promotes cultural activities as a way of achieving sustainable peace. She's lived through all forms of colonialism, coup d'etat in all forms in wars, quakes, floods, jails, and exiles. Yet she can rest in the knowledge that there is this love that the whole universe and mother earth exhibit and is there for us all to unite in joy. She's been making sure to create a world at peace in a healthy planet environment and she's been doing this as a volunteer, never a staff, but as one who will be an accompaniment to people who live in that way as Monsignor Romero, as he carried his ministry. 
and his martyrdom when he was assassinated, transforming and creating possibilities as we come together to be the difference. That's how she has been in the UN processes and in civil society processes, making a contribution, living simply to be able to be about the purpose rather than dictated by a salary or submitting to a political party or religion. And in this way, she came to know and work with many of us and many others with whom to partner around the world. Thank you, Marta, for being with us. And we are so happy to have you with us. Um, hola. Um, that means hello. Uh, it's about you know 1030 here in El Salvador right now. And I know that some of you are later than I am, and especially Patricia. So I hope that it's not so difficult. Um, I I will be 78 in November, and I am looking at what it means to be here on earth as always I did. This, the work that I did all my life, it came from my mom especially, and my father always supported it. And so uh, we didn't make a distinction about being an activist or being a human rights activist. We just wanted to live in peace and to have everybody peace, but not a piece of peace. So um, from my mom, I learned a lot of uh, ways of looking at things with a, you know, a vision of how is it affecting everybody that even hasn't been born. Um, we, from the very beginning, were challenged. You know, I'm the oldest of four sisters, and we were challenged to think through whatever we were facing, because we were usually having coup d'etats and having military dictatorships and a lot of foreign intervention. I do remember when I was very, very young, um, you know, the fear that was experienced by everybody because Guatemala was invaded because the people um, went uh, for, for a president, he, they elected a president that felt that the people really needed to have justice. And the justice wasn't even that much. All that he was talking about is the banana, that the bananas that they grew under the United Fruit Company, they should pay some tax, like a penny per pound. And that was too much. And so there was this very, very bloody military intervention. And you know that has marked the whole region, the whole part of Southern Mexico, and you know what is now wrongly called the Northern Triangle. You know where there is uh, what distinguishes the so-called Northern Triangle, which is Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, is the violence and the gangs and the organized crime. And you know, like it, like if this came from nowhere, that's how it is. And then you know, like also affects the the especially the area of the southern, eastern and western part of southern Mexico, where many many nations uh, live and uh, in poverty and suffering all kinds of attacks. When we had the war in my country, it it, it affected Honduras very much and also Guatemala. So a lot of people had to flee into Mexico. And it was the people, the indigenous peoples in southern part of Mexico that uh, received the people from our countries and, and, and gave them a place, a safe place to live. From there on, you know, like we were able to work with uh, the administration of governments, um, both uh, from our countries and also Mexico and bring the United Nations involved so that the people could have a place where they, they there was um, areas for refugees in that area. And also Mexico, as a result of that, uh, participated very, very actively um, for the peace accords, which were not something that you know, the majority of countries in the world was, uh, was for. But we saw in my country, in El Salvador, that we were not going to be able to win as we needed because uh, you know there was a all those things really 
are expressions of geopolitical uh, situations, meaning there are parties that uh, really uh, are behind those things happening for the purpose of taking you know, benefits for, for themselves. And also in that way, uh, you had an area of the world that would be supportive of positions that were very, very much about you know the what, what we call now the banana republics. Even though we never grew bananas, we grew coffee and sugar and cotton. But you know it's a way of talking about these nations that uh, during the previous wars in the fourth, you know the first and second world wars, uh, the there was these divisions of labor for peoples and for nature, and, and for peoples, nature and nations. And there, uh, you know, for example, we were to grow coffee, sugar, and cotton, and Guatemala, bananas. And that was the United Fruit Company mostly. And, you know, like it was such a thing that it's very important to understand how these things happen because it happened that the, the owner of the United Fruit Company was a family from the US that. Um, uh, you know, was part of the administration of government. He, the man was the secretary of state. So this, I say, because, you know, the way that Patricia is explaining the situations, we have to really dig in and really see why these things happen because it's not something that the people needed. And she was talking about the colonialism. Um, and I hope that people understand what, why, uh, a lot of Latin American people are very much about the decolonization process. And uh, why, what's the meaning of colonialism and decolonization? Well, the reason that we created that word is because when Columbus got lost in these areas, in these regions, he thought that he had gone to India. And so, you know, like, uh, even though he was lost and he was, almost ready to die out of sickness and everybody that was with him were really very hungry and sick and their ships were not well and we took care of them. But he said, I discover. Imagine that contradiction. And you know, the people that were in our regions, we were not looking at them as, you know, that we wanted to harm them really. It's not because we were perfect, but we didn't see why those, these were very needed people. And, but he said, I discover, and because I discover, I take possession of this land in the name of the queen and the church. And this is very important to know because, you know, it keeps going, 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 and then anybody that didn't abide by it, those of us that questioned, you know, even you know, I wasn't born at, at that time, but, the, you know, we had our communities and the indigenous peoples were not happy about what was happening because on the one hand, oh, you know, we had a different way of living, uh, a culture where, you know, wow. yes, the women with all the weaknesses that we might have, but they played a role and they were seen as very much of people of, of wisdom, people that have wisdom comes out of knowledge and because of deepening it and seeing how to bring it into the, so this life in the society. And that has to be done with grace. And for us, that grace has to be about really looking at any issue, but not with a punishable thing, position, but to be able to uh, work and solve it, you know, by discussion, by analysis, by figuring out how to work it in a way that we first thing it was no harm to nature, no harm to Mother Earth. And we, the, all, the various names that we have in the continent for the Earth, uh, you know, they all come to say the Mother Earth. And, and many times when we say it, people consider that we are very behind the times, that we don't really know who we are. And at that time, um, the colonizers felt that we didn't know any better, that we were just like little kids, that and they, they had big discussions about should they save us or not? Because some of the people in the church felt that, you know, we put people who meaning not in poverty because at that time we were not suffering poverty. We were living simply, but not simply living. We had meaningful lives. And so the, the, they felt that we should be educated and evangelized 
but the idea was that we didn't have souls like women in Europe at that time, they didn't have souls either and they didn't want anything so they couldn't have any participation in decision making. So imagine, I'm just saying this and I will not go into a lot, but the thing is that Columbus name in Spanish is Colón. So when he says, you know, out of all this experience, he says, I discover and therefore I take possession in the name of the queen and the church, that is colonialism, you know? That's what it continued to happen to, to uh, and that's why even in, you know, in Spanish, even the way that the bees work is a colony because all of them are working for the queen to be about what she had to be, but we are not bees, right? And so we have to figure out how to live meaningfully with a useful ex ex uh, existence. And even though you know there was a lot of repression and there is still a lot of repression that we are going through because what Patricia was sharing with you at this point, we are going through these terrible, terrible things in my country where everything is being turned, where nothing is respected. And there is a lot of uh, hatred that is being instilled in people because there have been a lot of mistakes and there, are, there has been people who have abused and all that, but we are not going to solve it by getting hateful and just destroying everything and then becoming uh, uh, dependent on a family that is all about just making money and, and making money by stealing and by having a lot of, uh, you know, we are indebted more than a hundred percent. And no matter how we explain to people, look, but that we are paying for all these little gifts that they are going, you know, they buy wheels right now but in order to get people to be on their side and vote. And so right now, the large majority of people that come from that kind of experience that I'm saying, well, you know, they are supporting whatever the uh, citizen president and or his group are doing, which is most includes women too. At any rate, the problem is that this practice of colonialism went all over, it got very globalized. And the reason that we are called Indians in Latin America and the Caribbean is because Columbus, Colón, thought that he had gone to India. So, you know, like I have great appreciation for the people of India. I have great respect for the people of India, but I am not an Indian and not, not even indigenous because, you know, the, we are all, all of us come from some originally from some nation that we originated from. So we are all, you know, in, indigenous peoples, but, but the word indigenous can be well used, you know, meaning that we are from the nation where we are, you know, that's where we came from. But the reason that the colonizers were using it is to make a racist difference. Like they are the ones from here, so we can exploit them, make them slaves and all that and take their lands. And we are the ones that, you know, have the, the power. And this power was given by the popes of those times. In those times, in the feudal times, I remember that it was the whole thing about, the witch hunts and all that. That was mostly about people who had knowledge and grace and all that. And, you know, people trusted them and that's how they solved a lot of the problems. So the there were pops that would have a coup d'etat against a, a, you know, a king or an emperor and vice versa. So the reason that, for example, in England, you have a different, a, a, you have a, a, a Christian religion, but it's the Anglicans, the Episcopal, it's very similar to the Catholic, but that's because the, pre, the, the, the king there developed against the Pope who wanted to take over. And now, now we are living all this now still in that situation where uh, the British went and then, you know, like, especially the people of Ireland, they stay Catholic, they didn't break with the Pope, so they are still paying for it. And so sometimes that's why to me it's important that Yes, we have the gift of truth telling. But we got to dig in. We have to really see why. And so that's why I say that we have to speak truth with power. And that means that we have to educate ourselves. That means that we have to know that the world is different than the planet. And don't go around saying that we're going to save the planet because there is no way that we can save the planet. Today is World Day of Environment and we should know what we have done to the environment to the point that now we are being urged by strongly that we must make peace with nature. And this is urgent because, you know, there cannot be life without nature. And the way that nature works, 
imagine this, you know, like I do work on oceans and I do it because almost nobody wants to work on oceans. And that process at the UN is very bad because it's a new system that Bill Gates gave to them. And so we have to figure out how to use that mechanism. It's hard, tough, everybody kinds of people. But you know, I am still there because the, uh, that's where life was born. That's my brothers and sisters, the oceans, the seas. But the thing that is so beautiful is that the way that the whole of nature was created, you know, it was about uh, creating this integrity, indivisibility that we were talking about, you know? And so uh, the forest, you know, they did the whole thing about the, the whole exchange of giving us oxygen, you know, and we will give CO2, which they turn into fruits. But because we have deforested everything, even legally, and that is happening even in Amazonia now, is happening that, um, you know, all of a sudden the forest cannot do that any longer. And, you know, the climate change, the warming of the earth is going on very strongly. And the, you know, the, the uh, glaciers are being melted and the water is going up and very soon it's going to be at least half a meter higher and we looking somewhere else. But the one thing that I learned that really bothered me is that because the forest, the trees cannot do it any longer, our brothers, the trees, they cannot do it any longer and the birds are suffering, everybody's suffering. But you know what? The oceans took over with love. They touched the glaze of it, you know? It started to work with the, the coral reefs and that's where the plankton is. And that's how they started to absorb the CO2. But because we continue to pro, do all kinds of pollutions of mind, spirit, and actions, and we don't respect anything. So, you know, it has come to the moment that probably the oceans cannot do it any longer. And we are killing the, uh, 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 the coral reefs and the plankton. And that means that there is going to be, you know, putrid is going to be bad. And then not only they are not going to be able to get the CO2, you know, to transform it, but they are going to emit methane. And this is very bad. So I don't want to get you scared, but I am going to say, we better do our work because this work that Jan has, Jan has helped us to see, you know, this uh, maternal, you know, gift economy, the whole thing is about that. And we have to see that, you know, when I see the COVID that has happened and these governments, everybody said, oh, we were caught out of, uh, you know, in surprise. No, they created regularly the conditions for this to happen because pandemics only happen where people live in poverty, extreme poverty, where people for centuries haven't had water, where the lands have been taken and they cannot nourish. And at this point, the best and most important thing that we can do, besides doing all these things, because now we have the pandemic like that, is not good enough if we don't nourish ourselves well. And that means health with food. And you know that's why we have to work on this very strongly. And that's why I accepted to work with all of you on this, because it is urgent. We cannot be talking about this with us, nice, interesting, whatever. We must address it with a sense of uh, duty and with a sense of urgency. And even all those governments are sent because people say the United Nations is not good because it doesn't do this and that. The United Nations is nations united. It's not even peoples united. And you know, even when we get together in the World Social Forum, we never really work like that. And so we have to know that the priority is that we must prioritize well-being of planet, nature, you know, everything that it gives life and peoples. That's it. And that means that we have to make major, major, major changes. But those people talk about all these things in all these meetings, but then they go home and they have been paid very well to go to all those meetings. And most of the social movements, I am not an activist. I belong committedly to action, action that will result in really being uh, global planetary citizens. So I'm going to ask quickly uh, my friend, uh, Diane, to show us quickly the pictures because I want you to have them, you know. I keep them around me so I can remember these things. And so, in the first one, what I wanted to show you is that there are ways that we have to do, which is to educate each other. And there are materials that we have to regularly study, you know. It cannot be that we are just going to do it whenever. 
it, it means that daily we have to take time to, uh, to really be about studying and figuring out the solutions. And that cannot be done unless we work together. So you see, we have a woman there who is really working on the issues. She's part of the social movements on food and nutrition. And then we say, we have something in the other side that is the indigenous people. It is the indigenous people that we must honor because from all over the world, they have been doing the work and they have continued to be um, you know, exploited and uh, repressed. And they want to, many times to take their knowledge and commercialize it. And that's part of the discussion I was having right before I came into this meeting. You know, how do we develop the ethical ways so that we can continue to produce uh, knowledge and consciousness without using it to make more money? And it, it's not that we are against the money. It's just that the money can really be the solution, and therefore we are going to do whatever so that we that that we can do that. And then um, this one here, where you have this young man, this person, you know, there is a transition that's going on. It's going. And part of the pandemic is part of it because we had to adapt and, you know, do all kinds of things to continue. So it's a transition. But what we are saying is that because the labor said, okay, there is a transition that's happening because there is going to be many jobs closures and, you know, we are going to pay the price because we are not being educated and figuring out how we can continue to work. So we want a just transition. But we are talking about that the just transition shouldn't just be a transition. It should be that we carefully look at what it means to be making sure the, trans the transition to be just for everybody, especially for those that haven't been born yet with the commitment to the seventh generation and understanding that we have to be doing justice to Mother Earth, to the rivers, to oceans, you know, living that consciousness. This is very urgent. So it's not only about jobs. Jobs is important, especially, you know, like in my country, there have been so many jobs that have been lost and especially in what is called the informal sector that is women mostly, you know, that are single women, uh, single uh, moms. And so they don't know how to make it. And what they're trying to create now is that you stay home and we're going to bring you food. And no, we don't want saviors. We should be able to be about living the kind of life that we have. So just transition is very urgent and not even in the whole process is about the UN is really done. The other one is that um, people are not using this language that is very important because it helps us see. The second picture is about, uh, and there it was, you know, this thing that we know that there is no more time. We cannot be not doing this work. We got to do it. So then going to the second picture, that's where you have a lot of more information that you can look for, you see. Um, and, and it helps people to really see what is it that we, we got to work with the youth. We got to figure out how to be together, how to learn about these things. And in order to do the care, the prioritize, prioritizing, you know, planet, nature, uh, environment, and prioritizing the uh, well-being of people, we got to understand what things are going on and how to go about it. So the last one here, uh, it tells us, you know, that there is no more time, that we got to be about what we have to do in a very efficient day in and day out. And sometimes I tell people, eight days a week, 25 hours a day. And people say, no, it's only seven days and, you know, 24 hours. No, <laughs> we got to do very strong. But because it's so much work, we got to unite with a lot of other people. We got to especially unite with the ones that are being affected the most. Then when we go to the third document there, which you are going to keep, um, um, mm -hmm. You know, some of you remember that Winona Laduc ran for vice president some time ago, right? Vice president for this country, for, for your country. And so she did a, um, you know, a, a reflection, which, you know, I know I, I met Winona when she was 16 and we became very good friends and we worked together always, even though we don't see each other that much now. But one of these things that she's saying is that uh, she said, you know, like just recently there was, uh, they found out that in uh, British Columbia, there was 215 
little bodies that uh, in a, in a you know in a place a religious place uh, a school that uh, where the indigenous people were taking and you know we are not talking about it but we cannot talk about it because to talk about it we have to talk about how is it that we got to where we got to and we have to be very present and gracious and figure out how to make things work. And it's not so easy. So for example, at the end, uh, Winona says, because we can cannot talk about Sand Creek or Castle boarding school, because we cannot talk about forced sterilization or smallpox blankets or Kit Carson in his scorched earth policy in the Southwest, because we have Andrew Jackson on our $20 bill, because we are one huge settlement on stolen land, we cannot talk about Israel because we are Israel. So we cannot do anything about that thing that we have to live and cannot allow us to sleep, you know, because of what's happening to Palestine. So that's going to be left to you. And then the next picture, um, it's about, um, you know, this is a, an indigenous man from uh, Ecuador, and he, he's, he's very well known for these kinds of pictures. So, you know, like humanity, the older, the child, the ones that haven't been born, we got to be about this very, very strongly. So all these pictures I chose on purpose to leave them as a, you know, pointers of how we can move. The next picture, um, and thank you, Diane, for keeping track with me. You see, we got to live in community. Can you imagine I spent seven, all the time of the pandemic, I had to spend it all alone. Nobody could come and see me because it was against the law to be in the streets. I didn't have food. I didn't have water. I had to figure out how. And, you know, people couldn't see each other. And um, it, it was against the law to go from one town to another, and I live in a rural area because that's where we took care of my father and mom. And so I'm, I was the only one living in the house at the time when everything was closed up. And so it has been very, very hard. It's, it's, uh, and, you know, even though I always understood what it means, um, how terrible it is to be in jail, but we cannot have the whole of the planet and the universe and everything as a jail. We got to figure out how to live in community. So that's why I shared that picture. So then we go to the next picture. Uh, one of the one of my friends works with young kids, and you know, many of us are really working very hard on the issue of polluted waters in El Salvador. 95% or more of the waters under this the earth and you know on top are polluted. It, the rivers are polluted, they are, being, they are dying. And so, you know, in one of the questions it was, well, how about that, you know, can you ask the kids how clean water looks? And then this young person said, we cannot ask them because they don't know, they never seen clean water, you know? And then we think that water comes in, this, in these bottles and it comes from Fiji and all this stuff. We got to touch base with Mother Earth, really. So we go to the next one the next picture. And so, um, you know, once in a while I get all caught up in my thinking. And so I was talking with Diane and she told me those are dream catchers because we, you know, in our heads we say, estos son los cachadores de los sueños, you know? And so we have to have our dreams regardless of what's going on. And we have to continue to laugh and dance and consider all the beauty that we have had. For example, when I think of so many of you that I have met throughout my years, once in a while when I feel that it's really too much and, uh, you know, I think of all these things, that all that bless the blessings that I have had. And, and know, for example, what my mom said, there is no truth that there is a hell because heavens we create and hell we create. And so be sure that in your path here on earth, you don't create hells and you create conditions that we can share about the paradise that we are. Because I came back from church one time and my mom's name is, was Eva, Eva. And I thought, I changed your name because that was the woman that made Adam, you know, I was about six years old. And she said, no, that's not true. And so she helped me to see, you know, to look up to what is supposed to be the ones to know and to dare see what was right in front of me, what is obvious. And so we go to the next picture. And, you know, the salamander and the butterflies. We are here to do the transformations. 
and we all have been evolving. And maybe, you know, if we don't do things properly soon, maybe we won't be around as humans, but we come back and we have to continue doing the work right now about the consciousness that we must be. And that consciousness that we are in the universe it, and the universe is versions united, you know? And it's about the beautiful thing, the, the beauty of life and being all about that and take care of it. You know, that our heart should be about so loving about all these things that it should transcend how we sometimes move because of all the things is, is happening. And when I was many times captured, I thought it's okay if I die tonight because I have lived a very, very meaningful life. And I had the blessing to work strongly to create the first, you know, um, the first uh, peace accord, you know, because we had to stop the war, not by bullets, but to bring back people together. And even though it was hard, we did it. And it became the first type of peace accords. Jan was very much part of it. I know Regina that is listening, she was part of it too. And so, you know, I am very, very thankful. And then we'll finish with the two pictures that we have right now. You see, that's how, that's how the universe is. And let's keep it in there. And this Latin American agenda, it used to be that, you know, it's very, very good with the, uh, you know, a lot of articles to help us reflect and all that. And every year is created. And so in the first ones, we saw that it is telling us, you know, the tsunamis that we have right now. And then that each little cause and the big cause are the one and the same. And that we have to work it together because we must be about this universe that we have. And that's where the answer can be when we can be transformed and um, very mindful of all all sectors and all the ages, and especially of the ones that haven't been born, because, you know, like, how are we going to end this century? That's why, you know, the movement that I created was, is called 23rd century, because I go to the future and with the people we thought, oh, they told me it's going to take about 200 years in 2020, you know, in the, in, in the 19, in this, 20th century, they say it's going to be about 200 more years before we can really, really experience peace. Okay, but what kinds of things uh, would look for, you know, how do we uh, see peace coming about? And then they thought about it. And then I told them, so we go to the future, we go to the 23rd century and start doing those things that we can do right now. And that's how we do it. And that's how we do need resources and all that. But the main resource is within, is the people. And so the last one is, um, you know, that's the work that we have to do, integrality. And uh, at, at this point, you know, today is the uh, World Day on Environment. And the task is to work from now on, and especially for the next 10 years, we have to work on the uh, on the um, bringing back the environment and the restoration of ecosystems, because we started to say that we have to have, you know, uh, not nature-based solutions. But then they started to figure out that they were going to, you know, do mono systems and things like that. And no, we are not talking about that. We are talking about the ecosystems and ecosystem, ecosystem until we get, you know, we get to do this work. So that's basically what I wanted to share with you. And I hope that we can do it. Gracias. Gracias, Marta. That's a lot of information to take in, both of you, in the perspectives that you have um, in your parts of the world. And I think this is the one of the gifts of the salons, is being able to see these views very diversely. But when we listen carefully, the themes that are present here are What's needed is for each of us to use our voice. The economy is the economy that we are as humans. And by Jen's theory, it comes from the mother relationship to the child, which Marta talked directly about and which Patricia talked about with her children. So these are the things that we try to make visible that we don't articulate out loud. And I'm just pleased and thank you so much, Marta, for your presentation and those beautiful slides. And um, 
yes, it's time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be opening up for questions. If you have questions, would you please put them either in the chat box or in the Q&A? And I'm just wondering, Jen, while you were listening, did you have anything that you wanted to contribute before we actually take our first question? Well, I just wanted to say that uh, both of these marvelous women have uh, done uh, lives of gifting, gifting the truth, gifting the uh, realities that are in their countries and in their environments to, to, to speak it up to people who are making things worse instead of better. And we, if we are informed about the truth, we can change. If we're not informed, we can't. And uh, it's really hard nowadays to tell the difference because there is so much propaganda coming from the governments and uh, advertising and in, in social media and everything uh -huh. that, um, that that gift of the truth really needs to be given. So I want to just thank you both for uh, all the great lives you've lived and the good things that you've done. Thank you, Jen. You gave us this gift too. <laughs> yes. And thank you, Diane, for moving my slides. <laughs> thank you. So are we ready for um, some questions? Liliana, would you like to pose the first question? Yes, I have a first question from an anonymous attendee, and this goes to Patricia. And she, the person says, what a courageous person. That's what speaking truth to power requires. And then the question that she poses is, is Patricia in touch with any of the group that defend human rights to help her? I'm not, uh, I'm not really in touch with any human rights groups. Um, there are groups that uh, support media freedom and all. And they have uh, they have approached me and they've said that we are there to to help you and maybe uh, support you for the legal fees and so on. But since uh, I didn't really need the legal fees, so I didn't get back to them. And somebody did um, because I had two cases in the Supreme Court. Somebody did send me one form, uh, one group, which is an international group. Uh, you know. Uh, human rights defenders. But when I tried to fill up that form, it was so complicated. I I, I failed to fill up that form. <laughs> yes. well, I, I, saw, I saw these questions in the chat box, which says, which asked me, do we have mourning practices for the dead or for any losses? We, you know, the, the my tribe, the Khasi tribe, we really mourn the dead. We keep them for three days in the house. And in these three days, people come and go and we offer them food, we offer them tea. They come, they sit. And then uh, before they leave, they'll put a hundred rupees in the hands of the, the person who's closest to the, to the dead person. So uh, then on the third day is the burial especially if it's an elderly person in the family, then, uh, you know, we'll slaughter a pig and uh, cook food so that everyone can, can have the food and go back. Uh, so for the dead years, for any other losses, no, I, we don't have any rituals for that. And because uh, we have this morning rituals for the dead, this pandemic has done away with all that. Imagine only 10 people are allowed to go for the, for the funeral and those 10 must be family members. So we are all so distraught by not being able to attend the funerals of friends and relatives. I lost my uncle, I couldn't go. So yeah, then, uh, th then the next question was, are there any initiatives initiation rituals for children into adulthood? And do these include sexual education for children? We don't have any such initiation ritual. In fact, I remember when I had my, my menstruation, the first time I was 
I was 13 years and I was quite scared. And then it was just my grandmother who told me what to do and how to do it. So it was kind of not very openly discussed. It, um, it's, it's seen as um, embarrassing. So, so there's no, no sex education also. There's no, sex is not discussed at all. It's, uh, it's very hush hush. And uh, even in school, teachers find it very difficult to discuss sex education. And then uh, education for male and female children about the mores of uh, matriarchy. There also, I'm sorry to say, we do not really have, uh, whatever we imbibe, we imbibe from our elders, from our parents and grandparents. We, we come to know that this is the customary practice, the tradition, but nobody really teaches anyone anything. You know, that I, I think that's how it is in all indigenous societies. We just transmit. And I want to uh, say something that I had forgotten in my presentation, which is that uh, I'm le leading a, a movement for cleaning up rivers. And we call that Operation Clean Up. And we do this every Saturday, except for now, because we're under lockdown. Uh, we have a big, really big group of people, you know, it's become a people's movement. And I'm so happy that uh, to be leading this because our rivers have become so polluted. They've become almost dumping ground. Every week when we go and clean the river, we come back, we, we, we retrieve so much of garbage, tons of it. And that garbage, of course, goes into the into the, the place where everything is dumped and then turned into manure or whatever. So yeah, are there any more questions for me? Um, there might be there might be some that come up, but let's um, take a beat for now. And um, I just wanted to comment that yes, indigenous cultures, living traditions, um, there isn't a quote unquote formal education. That is really a Western construct, how you learn to be in life, because you're learning to be in life be around your community. Mm -hmm. You know, the little children are with the older children, and they're with their parents and their grandparents, and they're, they learn by doing, not by being taught. Mm -hmm. They're actually in a state of being in relationship to the world around them. So it's a very different construct. I think yeah, really, than formal really education. Everything. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to make that note. And I wonder, Judith, if you had a question for us. Um, Peggy notes the parallel between Patricia's experience of colonialism and Mar Marta's, um, although the colonizers in uh, uh, Patricia's case were non tribals, and uh, in Martha's, there were. Um, uh, Columbus and the Spanish and today United Fruit Company and the uh, US government. And um, can you comment on the fundamental question of how to resist domination by people and corporations backed by governments um, that um, oppress us in ways that um, abuse human rights, uh, people's human rights, the right, human rights of people and I would add of the environment. Uh, which one of you would like to speak truth to power in that question? Who wants to go first? Cool. Patricia? Kong, yeah. Patricia, go okay. Yeah. Go so we, uh, we are constantly fighting the mafia, you know, the coal mafia. But unfortunately, it is not the colonizers who are exploiting our resources. It's our own tribal elite. And that's the saddest part because See, you can fight the outsider, but it's very difficult to fight the insider. Th these are your own people. They've learned the trade of, you know, of, of corporatizing natural resources. Actually, uh, see, when we look at UN documents, you have these, what you call the common property resources, like water, like forests. Now, even water sources are privatized and not by any outside forces, by our own people. So what they've done now is they will buy up a water source and then they will sell water. 
So people, I mean, these were free resources for a very long time. It's only in the last 20 years that we've had to pay for water. And it's now become a big business. Then uh, forests, you know, trees that are only this girth are being cut and sent out of the state. So uh, it is very painful to watch all this and uh, you feel helpless sometimes because you don't find enough people who are concerned. And even amongst those who are concerned, everybody is looking at, you know, at surviving. Nobody has time for activism. So that again is a big challenge. Thank you, Kong Patricia. Um, that is very difficult from the inside to have to address those issues. Marta, I wonder if you had something to offer to this uh, very big question. Well, that's why I keep saying that we have to go to the, you know, how it happened. It has been on purpose that these things are happening. And there are people that make sure that we create societies that are very much against that, what should be our priority. So for example, uh, you know, before, um, before the colonizers came as they came, there were other nations that came, you know, like even people from the northern part of Europe, and they they mixed with people, and it was different. I, I think that, you know, like culture is very important, and we have now a culture that is about disposable this, disposable the other, and, you know, like even the other day, I was surprised because we are producing so much trash that we have to put a lot of the money of the municipality into uh, keeping, you know, the trash out. But why don't we, you know, have the, you know, the people, the people are the key, the people involved in keeping everything well as part of, you know, we are the government. Those other people are our functionaries, public functionaries, and we should, uh, yeah, we should uh, contract them to do a, a whatever they, they say that they can do it, and we better check where you're very well what they do or not. But do we should know that we are the state, we are the government, and it is our duty to educate ourselves to really know what government governing is for, because it has to be governance and governability. And so we cannot do this when we keep people for centuries in a state of need and survival. And that's why we are opposing so much what the present administration of government and it should be called administration of government. And even though it's hard, it's like when we many times say he or her, or you know, she, uh, she's he, and then be, men mostly say, no, the, you know, women are in, in, included in there. You shouldn't be doing that. And then women sometimes go along. We keep have to do this thing that we have to do because that's liberation. It's about being the wholeness that we are because at this point we have a lot of holes, not wholeness. Mm -hmm. And so that's mm -hmm. also one of the reasons that uh, even though, you know, people participate today, there was big demonstrations in my country where they are denouncing the fact that we don't have water, that there is no food for the people. Not everybody is doing mm -hmm. it, but the ones that understand, they are out there. And, you know, some of us are also were joining, you know, virtually, even though, you know, this virtual thing sometimes is not very, very virtuous. But anyway, you know, we got to keep track of who we are and why are we here on earth? Because a lot of what's happened, we get co-opted. And right now, people got co-opted because they were really up to their ears with anger <clears throat> with what has happened. Yeah, but then, you know, we will react to the anger and not to, you know, our higher self. And so we got to continue doing the work even though we might just be the remnant, you know? And I remember that at, uh, at uh, Regina's once when I was meeting with them and, you know, I had made a presentation, she took me to a is the small uh, uh, room where I was staying, and there was a book next to to the bed. And, you know, I was so tired. I said, no, 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 I'm not going to get tempted and see. But, you know, it says, the parable of the sower. And I thought, no, I better just at least check a little bit. I spent the whole night, and it was really good. Octavia Butler talking about the, each action is a plant. It's a seed that we have planted, and it is going to give fruits. And you know, the longest that we keep track of that, the sooner that we might see better fruits. 
but we got to do it on purpose. And that's why, you know, I do the work in the communities. Like this afternoon, I'm going to go and work with some people in a, in a place. But then, you know, like I do the work at the United Nations, even though it's very frustrating and now it's even getting worse. But then I say, you know, you are not fit for purpose. You continue to talk about peace, but you're talking about a piece of peace, not real peace. Sustainable, durable peace is something else, you know, and then some people make faces at me and I say, yeah, I know that you don't want to hear, it, but the whole purpose of the UN is so that we can live in peace, at peace with each other, with myself, with everybody in a healthy environment. Otherwise it's not worth it. Thank you, Marta. And I wanna thank you again for bringing me with you for the 13th development of um, you know, the processes that I was able to participate in at the UN. That was a very enlightening experience. I hope to go again sometime. Good. Yes, I would be happy to work with you on that and maybe Regina and other people too. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Jen, did you have any comments that you wanted to share at this point? That's a very big question <laughs> that, that we were just asked. Well, I was just thinking about, um, about water and how water is a gift and was a gift. And now we've seen it be commercialized. And uh -huh. that's just the way the market takes over everything. And that is patriarchal capitalism. And it's the system of taking gifts mm -hmm. and, and being a parasite on the gifts of, the, of Mother Earth, of women, mm -hmm. and uh, of poor people everywhere, workers, and just a very few people, the few billionaires, uh, are, are sucking off all of the wealth of the world. So mm -hmm. that is the reason I think that we're in this terrible situation we are is because we're in a system that's really very negative and very anti-human. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Before mm -hmm. I, I, I go to, or we go to something else, this piece that um, Jen just brought is very, very urgent because you know, and that's part of the thing is n we can learn these things and we, uh, and we should be able to see, okay, that means that we got to figure out how to work together. The, the, the key is together because, you know, water is now commercialized in futures, you know, future markets. It's going to be in Wall Street. And, you know, like it came out in the news and people just talk about it, some, some of them. And we didn't do, for example, a serious discussion after that. Uh, but for example, here in my country, we have been fighting for 15 years for the right to have water as a constitutional human right universally. And that, 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 you know, we spelled out everything. And so with the takeover that has happened now, about 1500 cases or that were, you know, being discerned in the, in, in the uh, uh, assembly legislature, you know, they just came up and they said, just like in your country, you know, when uh, Trump took over that day, he erased everything about the environment, you know? And so this is the way that they have come. And so they decided that they were going to archive everything, including the work that we are doing on food sovereignty for food security. And in each one of those, we work, we work on the issue of water and how, who are the ones that affected the most? Uh, how, what are we going to do with the water that is polluted? So I think that this is very important and maybe, you know, we should once in a while have uh, discussions like this on major issues on how this is affecting because to me, you know, what has happened in terms of Palestine, it really makes me feel like oh, we cannot do anything, but that doesn't mean that I'm giving up. I continue to think and figure out how I tweet. I do tweeting very strongly. And there is a woman that is there in the group with us now, who is a, a Native American person with whom I work very closely on the issue of water and indigenous rights and all that. And the one thing that I want to stress that the indigenous people have been fighting graciously the fight about taking care of Mother Earth. And now it's time that we join them as a very, very serious ethical, moral, spiritual concern. So that they are working about you know, the water for sure, because that's what that whole thing in the Midwest in the US is, right? So I just wanted to say that and thank you for bringing it up, Jen. Um, I just know that, you know, maybe we're going to already 
maybe we have lost. But to me, the real loss is if I stop doing what I know that I better do. That's right. That's right. We may not see the changes in our lifetime, but we need to set examples for the youth that are coming forward to continue to raise the issues and, and shift the change. They will not understand uh, the through line without the elders still present, holding mm -hmm. the space for them to step forward so they can step through the door and take over. So thank you for that, Marta and Jen and Patricia. It's very beautiful. So let's um, see if there's another question. Um, is it uh, Judith that has a question for us maybe? It's me, it's my turn. Okay, Liliana. I have yes. a question from John Marler to Patricia. Question to Patricia Mukham. Thank you for everything you have chosen to share with us. Will you tell us about the nature of your research on your tribe, the Cassie, and what is more in, most important in this research for your dedication to your willingness to risk everything for justice and truth? Um, so this research uh, has, I mean, a lot of this is ongoing research because uh, societies are evolving and uh, a lot of our practices are also evolving to meet the needs of the modern times. So many of the things that we practiced even 20, 25 years earlier, we've had to give up in order to accommodate change. So I'm trying to record these changes. I'm trying to understand uh, whether our quest for modernity and uh, you know has has pushed us to become so commercial that we've forgotten what our ancestors have taught us our ancestors had beautiful um, what should i call them uh, beautiful sayings beautiful anecdotes very beautiful teachings about never being greedy about uh, caring caring especially for neighbors because see uh, tribes are a community we call ourselves a community because we care for each other but when that caring and bonding is lost then we cease to be a community and that's what i'm i'm seeing today that's what i'm trying to also capture because there is also a certain kind of toxic um, patriarchy that is that is increasingly being seen in the way that people do the mining. Mining is, you know, it. I tell you, whenever I visit some of these rural areas, it is really, really painful because you can see the earth being gouged out and the limestone, you know, the limestone boulders have come down because they've used dynamite. And uh, you can see that the earth is suffering and yet you can't do anything much. And then people will defend it with very, very flimsy uh, defenses that this is also needed because it's livelihoods for some. But livelihoods at what cost? You know, this, this cost to the environment is, is really, really very expensive for us because we are experiencing climate change a lot now here in our part of the world. And uh, uh, then now with the pandemic, what we see is, uh, you know, in our, in, again, in our part of the world, the largest number of farmers are women. Whether, you, whether those who are growing rice, whether those who are growing vegetables. And the other day, because of pandemic, the markets are closed. So the government made some kind of a, of a huge thing for them by the roadside because there are no vehicles. They couldn't sell the tomatoes and all the other vegetables and they just threw them there. It, it really made me cry because, I mean, look at the loss. And uh, the system doesn't care for this loss. The system is not compensating them. They've put in so much, they've invested so much to grow these crops, these vegetables. And now when it's time to harvest, 
there isn't there aren't any takers anymore because the supply line is all cut uh, we can't export them to the other states uh, so uh, my research basically captures all this and uh, does not glorify matrilineal because you know in the past people have glorified it so much that you had all kinds of scholars coming in to to say that oh this is a, a kingdom of women this is a paradise for women and all that but they haven't really understood the ground realities women suffer a lot here because we carry so much of responsibilities i don't know if i've answered that question though yes you you did yeah i'm sure that you could talk much more about it in the dialogue um but i think that you did answer the question so thank you so much for that patricia okay how about another question judith are you ready you're muted you need to unmute both of you have been very active on um social media and um, I know that at least Patricia has written a book and I wonder if you can tell us more if we want to follow your work um, and uh, see what you've been doing, um, how do, what are the links and, and um, how do we uh, find your book? I, I uh, didn't, I looked for it on Amazon and I couldn't find it there. Ah, I'll try and, and see how we can reach the book to you. But if you just Google me, you'll see a whole lot of articles uh, that I write from time to time. I write a Friday column for my newspaper and I also write for another paper from another, you know, another publication and then for other online uh, web uh, portals. So if you Google me, you will be able to read a lot of my articles. And um, Kong, Kong, Patricia, would you be able to send us uh, a link? If you send it to um, me or Jen, that where people could purchase your book online from your publisher, maybe that might be useful. And we'll make sure yes. that we put that link up um, when we post the video on our website. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. And, yeah. And then on social media, are you on Facebook? Can people follow you there or um, are I'm you on, on Twitter? I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Okay. You like to tweet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and okay. So Marta, what about you? Um, how do women find you, you and your work and where can they follow you? Well, uh, I think that if they start paying attention to what's happening in terms of the real, real issues as uh, take care of the planet, environment, human rights, they, they will see things more than, you know, following me is important that they do that. But then, you see, I, I don't do very much of these things that people do. But I, once in a while, yes, I, I write chapters for, for people and, you know, in their chapter, in their books. Um, I don't do Facebook on purpose. It's, um, I need to tweet. And so I, this morning I tweeted very much about the 215 kids, you know, and asking the pop that this is something that has me very upset. And then I don't see appropriate answer. And also to the government of the, where that happened, you know. And so, and then also uh, I've been tweeting about energy. We are working on energy right now. And I, I was tweeting about the environment, but that I do because I figured that, you know, uh, somehow I don't need to dedicate it to somebody, but I do send it to certain people that are followed a lot. So I'm trying to work with the, uh, you know, the, the, the social imagination to, to keep people aware of things that uh, are important that, that we have to work with. And so, for example, today, I, I also was tweeting about uh, the guy who is the citizen president of my country, who says that there is a fifth step that we have to have. And this is something that, you know, he said two weeks, two, two days ago in a, in a conference where they close everything and the only thing that we can do is listen to him. And so he said the fifth step is organize everything for the, the, to the total takeover, you know, and so, uh, I, I was tweeting about that because 
it's not about taking over. It's really about working with everybody. Nobody should be left behind in terms of having a presence in creating the quality of life that we have for planet and people. Also in migrations, I work very hard on that because it's a major, major, major issue. And so uh, for me, the way that we should be working on migrations is to know that people have the right to migrate travel if they want to, but not forced like we are in our countries, that because there is so many feminicides in the whole continent, then people have to flee for, you know, for their life. And then they go through all kinds of situations where they are not uh, taken care of properly. So while we have to solve those problems at the same time, we should know that you know, we still have to make sure that each nation becomes a sanctuary for the, the peoples, and nature and that there are ways about working on that and so we really have to be about to me it doesn't matter also how much we know how much we study if if it's not part of our culture because culture is what we cultivate and so how do we cultivate that that has the integrity of being in this harmony with uh, you know uh, nature with uh, with all the species and also uh, with people that haven't even been born yet. So that's what I do. So I cannot even say, look for it because one time I wrote something on a book that it was inheriting our mother's gardens. And you know, like I, I said that my mother's garden was the new creation. And then I went on to say that what was going uh, in my country uh, during the war and in Nicaragua was that, that was about uh, creating a need any garden, that was not about being, you know, the new creation that we need to create. So this is the people that had invited me to, to write us that article told me that they were considering, it, considering not to print it, not to publish it. And I told them, that's okay. I don't need to be published, you know? And then I said, but because they said, if you don't remove those things, you know, those political aspects, but everything is political, even asking me to remove it. And even if I had removed it, I said, go ahead, don't, don't print it. And then I didn't touch base with them anymore. <laughs> but then it got printed. Yeah. But anyway, you know, so I don't have very good experiences on those things because my way of thinking is sometimes uh, difficult for me and difficult for others. Well, I think both you, Marta, and Patricia are very direct. You don't hold back. And I think it's important. It's a good example for women to be able to see that the resiliency of both your joys and your sorrows have brought you today to this place in our mm -hmm. salon, but you've yeah. managed to be resilient and have your voice be heard and not give up and see a future that is still sustainable for generations mm -hmm. to come. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So what Marta is saying is that you can follow her on Twitter, yeah. but she doesn't <laughs> do Facebook and she does like to tweet so you'll get to hear her tweet rants and um, find her there. So and I don't uh, like to tweet. I better do it though. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I and I heard the news and I thought, oh no, I better tweet this. And then I say, oh, when I wake up, wake up, I do it. No, I get up and I do it because it's not that I want to do it. It's just that you know, I want to put it in the universe where anybody can see it and and know that yeah, we cannot be doing you know. Uh, future markets with water. <laughs> no, it's very important to tweet because uh, those who run the government take notice, and sometimes they do they do mm -hmm. take up things that you push them to do. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that. I recently uh, I recently told my government in a tweet. I said, "Why don't you set up war rooms?" Because people are calling me uh, when they need a hospital bed when they need uh, an ambulance. So if we have war rooms attended by people who are trained, then people don't need to, to go around, you know, to flounder around. So then they set up these war rooms and they, they set up these war rooms right down to the block levels. And it's served a very good great. purpose. Yeah. yeah, that's great. It's true. And then you smile, right? <laughs> that's that's fabulous. So thank you for those answers. Liliana, do you have another question for us? Yes, I have a question from Vijay Lakshmi Brara. 
Patricia, you raise a very important issue. How are the cultural moors tackling this internal class and, ger and gender differences, especially the rise of the new elite? Uh, it's very, very difficult, you know, uh, when it comes to this personal pursuit, this greed, then all the cultural mores collapse. People don't, don't want to listen to you anymore. And they think all these, you know, uh, aphorisms that are given to us by our ancestors, that they all don't stand the test of time. That's what they say. Why should we listen to this? Uh, this is the time for us to make money. And, and then they say, that uh, especially the coal miners, they say that the money they earn from coal has been able to, to uh, has been has enabled them to send their children and their grandchildren to good institutions, not in the state that we are in, but outside the state and even outside the country. And they they keep saying that you know without this money we wouldn't have been able to get this good education. But then at the same time, these, these tribal elites, uh, after having amassed so much money from limestone, from coal, they are not investing in healthcare. None of these areas, coal mining areas, have even one good hospital or, or one good educational institution. And the other day, I got this frantic call from a young lady who lives in this area called East Jaintia Hills where all the coal mining happens. She said to me, you know, ma'am, I'm a lawyer, but I'm so afraid to speak up because if you speak up in this area, you'll be killed. So she said they've set up about 25 coke, coke plants, C-O-K-E, coke, C -O -K -E, which, which uses coal as a raw material. And this coke plant emits so much of polluting smoke that they say they're not able to breathe anymore there and they're not able to get potable drinking water. You know, we have two rivers in this mining area that have become completely toxic. And during the winter months, the water turns blue and then all the fish die. The fish just float on top, they're dead. And we're not doing anything. It's it's a very desperate situation, Vijay. You know it because I've been writing about it and uh, constantly. So culture somehow has lost out. And and what culture are we talking about? We are talking about values. We are talking about those traditional values that have sustained us for decades or millennia, but now those values are thrown on the way. Nobody cares anymore. And that I think, maybe also, you know, sometimes I think that Christianity also has played some kind of role in, in making us believe that all those, all those belief systems of tradition, of the indigenous faith are all you know, dispensable. This is what I feel about Christianity. It, it has made us so modern that we've forgotten our roots. Thank you, Patricia. Marta, I wondered if you um, wanted to respond to what Patricia had offered just now in that question, in that response. Do you have anything you want to say about that? And uh, because the way that she was answering, you know, um, was she talking about the cultural aspect, right? Yes. Uh -huh. It's because this is the problem. There is a very um, direct, um, aggressive way to make a different culture for all of us. And culture supposedly for educated people, what they should mark is like going to concerts and going to the museums and things like that. But, you know, uh, there have been, since we signed the peace accords, people have been forced to open up to foreign investment. And foreign investment is about eating all that food that is not good for us. And so now we have a lot of problems 
you know, when we were very healthy people and we would have been able to withstand uh, the pandemic, we would have, uh, you know, we, we now have obesity and in, in uh, the whole area, you know, and we are not healthy. And, and so I think that we, we have to know that this is a direct attempt to make us be the way that is acceptable for you know those uh, businesses, and you know people are now buying all kinds of stuff and uh, all this uh, clothing that comes from the U.S. You know, and then they buy all this also. Like we need so much of that, and then they even put it in the editorial. Yeah, but now you can be looking more decent. And then, you know, it is it, it's, it's better for when you go looking for a job, all kinds of things like that. It's not going to be that they stop doing it to us. Because when I was talking about the fact that we had developed a position on how to take care of nature and that the solution for climate change is nature-based solutions, they immediately turn it into monocultures. And that's why then we developed the ecosystems, you know, based in ecosystems, um, because then we have to get to that level. And the women and the indigenous peoples and the youth got together on that. And, and right now we are fighting that, that language at the UN, because otherwise, all of a sudden, there is all these avocados that are so delicious and so health, healthy and all that in, in Chile. And they cut all these trees, and then now, you know, they have to use a lot of water, it's a monoculture, and, and, and it destroys the, the environment. So it, it will demand more and more that we know what culture is and, and that we take stands. And it's, as Patricia says, it's not easy. Right now, we are at risk here in my country because those of us that have a different point of view and we voice it for the sake of everybody, we are seen as enemies. And that was done officially two weeks ago on a Saturday the citizen president, and I say citizen president because he is a citizen like us, and we have hired him to preside, not to tell us what to do, not to be our savior. But then, you know, like he said, all those people who don't agree with us, they are the internal enemies. And why did he say that? Because the U.S. said, because of all the corruption that there is in this government, we are not going to give any money directly to the government. We are going to give it to the, social, the civil society. But, you know, like social movements don't get any of that money. And we're the ones that are in the forefront taking stands. So you see, um, we are already being seen as such enemies. So I believe, I tell you, my sisters keep saying, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. But it's not that my people, my sister, they love me. But it's just that they don't want to go through the pain of whoever, whatever happens out of this repression that we're going through. Yes, there are so many challenges on the planet right now, many challenges. And I think it's, it's uh, important for us to be able to hold that, uh, the ideas that are happening, the physical things, the realities that are happening and see them both as uh, the joys and the sorrows. We need to be able to see these awful things so that we can choose a better future, be different to make a, a different place, a better place for us all. So thank you both. And I think we might have, um, we might have time for just some closing remarks. No, no other questions because we're eight minutes before the top of the hour. So um, I'm wondering, Judith, do you have a, a quick question that you wanted to? Following up on what Letitia said, um, both of you have, have done a little bit of this, but can you give us an example of a successful action that you undertook? <laughs> yeah, um, I can speak for myself. I, I have led all kinds of movements one of the movements is called People's Rally Against Corruption. <laughs> <And> <laughs> we started this movement because our government was going to sell out a very, very premium uh, property in a different state in Calcutta. Uh, Calcutta is another metropolitan city where we normally have you know, these homes belonging to different states so that when, when a person from Meghalaya goes to Calcutta, he, he or she can stay there. Well, the government suddenly decided in 2001 
that it was going to give that to a private party. And somehow I, I got wind of this from some politician. And then we made into a very big movement and the government fell. You know, the government toppled. So I think that that, that is a success story. That's a great story. Yeah. A shiro in our in our presence. I think that is the first instance of a government falling on account of corruption in at least in India. That's fabulous. Uh, do, can you say what year was that? Do you remember? That was 2001. Excellent. Thank you so much. What about you, Marta? Can you give us an example of a successful campaign? I think that the most important thing is that we keep tracking and doing what we have to do. And, you know, it, it, this has to advance. But we have had many, many processes that, you know, even though it, it, there might come a time that we lose it, but we were there, you know. And so, for example, helping to stop the war in my country and in Guatemala and Honduras, that was a major thing that we did. And we got peoples from all over the world to be in solidarity with us and to stand and march. The, big, the biggest march after Vietnam in the US was about our country. And so we created all that solidarity. But at the same time, we were able to create a, a governments that were on the side of the Salvadorian people to be about the peace accord. And you know, I was part of that. Just recently, for example, we we um, been working very hard on the Escazú agreement, and that's important that you are asking about this because Escazú is a, a process that took about since 1992. We have worked on and off, on and off, from the Air Summit, uh, you know, the, in the declaration there is principle ten that is about having a tribunal for the defense of defenders of human rights and defenders of environment because they get killed all the time. So we took it back about five years ago and we've been working very hard at it. And in our country, we led it and at, at, at also continentally. And on Earth Day this year, it became the law for the whole continent. And now we are working to make sure that each country uh, does whatever is needed to uh, create the legislature and the processes for uh, human right defenders and defenders of the rights of nature and Mother Earth have that tribunal. And so today, one of my partners is in, you know, in the in in the eastern region with the indigenous people working, you know, so that they understand this and they know that there is this because, you know, once we create it, it's important that people know that exists and how to use it. And then we have to take it to universities, et cetera, et cetera. But then at the same time, it is a challenge to, to all the other continents that they should do the same thing. And so we are working with people in other continents so that they can take it up so that then it will be a global thing. Or for example, I work very hard on the International Criminal Court and I knew that my country was not going to support it. So I just work with globally and uh, uh, regionally and it became that, you know? So it's just simple example, but working together, you can achieve it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Marta. Jen, are there some closing remarks that you might want to share before we, we actually close the session? Well, um, I guess I'd say that uh, we do have a huge problem in front of us and around us and we, everywhere in this, uh, this very strange um, series of years of the pandemic and the over, the, the, the huge um, disaster of the governments and the ways they are dealing with all of the problems and the capitalism and the greed and everything and, and Mother Earth. And it's just women like the two of you or the three of you and met probably many of you who are listening and the other women uh, on our team that are, are making the difference. And our work continues and we're trying to do it. So I think uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I think it's really important 
for us to recognize that often the good work is not acknowledged in a, in a global massive way. And we're not aware of all of these good works that have been completed. So um, thank you both Patricia and Marta and Jen for your theory that brings us all together. Um, I wanna thank all the women uh, who have, who are part of our team, Liliana and Judith for the questions, our tech support, Diane and Elena Skoko. Um, I wanna thank you both for the behind the scenes that you do for us and make sure that our technology stays clear and clean. And all the women in the International Feminists for the Gift Economy Network who keep us steady on our path. I also want to invite, invite all of you to join us in two weeks. That's June the 22nd, which will be very close to summer solstice um, for our, oh, is it the 19th, June 19th? Yeah. Very close to the summer solstice for our next salon, uh, salon number 15 with Arella Sh um, Shamadi. Shad, Shad me. Shad me. And she's going to be presenting, um, she is from Israel, so she is going to be presenting the gift of failure. And I think we'll have some insight into the Israeli-Palestinian expression. So I hope you'll join us. And also Sherry Mitchell will be returning and she's going to be talking about trauma and survival and um, things that we need to know about that and how we care for ourselves and each other. So I wanna invite you to join us again um, our video will be posted from today's salon, probably before Monday. Um, and we hope that you'll uh, see it again at maternalgifteconomymovement.org. If you wanna be notified of our upcoming salons and events, you can sign up at our website, maternalgifteconomymovement.org. There's an email list there and we send out a notice. Uh, we can't, um, use the, the email addresses from this event for anything past just a thank you. So if you wanna know if things coming up, please do join our, our email list. And if you have any other questions or comments for our speakers, uh, Marta Benavides or Patricia Mukin or Genevieve, you can send them to us at maternalgifteconomy at gmail.com. And we will make sure that you're connected up um, any questions that we were unable to answer in today's session will be distributed to the speakers with, along with all of the um, attendees. They'll have your email address so that they'll be able to respond to you directly. So we want to thank everyone for joining us today. And we want to thank anyone who's listening. Please do share this information because again, speaking truth to power isn't an easy thing, but it's a very important thing for us to be able to do. And it's a very maternal thing. Sometimes we have to tell our children very difficult truths so that they can actually take a stand for what's right. Be well, everyone, stay safe, be kind to one another, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you so much. This is Leticia Layson saying goodbye. We'll see you again Bye. in two weeks. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye -bye. Take care.